identity. He's God. It led on to his ascension and his present heavenly reign. It guarantees the believer's present forgiveness and justification and is the hope of eternal life in Christ for the believer. Our faith rests on this truth. Jesus did rise again. In fact, Paul dedicated uh, pretty much a whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 to this very subject. Because even in the early days of the church, people were asking, hey, did Jesus really do that? Did Jesus really rise again? And yes, it is with certainty, and we believe by faith that Christ did rise from the dead. So why does that matter? Well, let's look at John 3, because, as with all of us, we have questions sometimes, don't we? Well, there was a man in John 3 in those days who had questions as well, and I'm going to give you a little background, because we're going to jump right into uh, John 3, 16, uh, probably one of the most familiar passages in all the scripture. Uh, even if you don't know what it says, you've probably heard that reference or seen it. On a, on a sign at a football game or something, right? You know that reference, John 3, 16. But what happened before is even more important to that truth being so important to us as Christians. And that was a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus, a powerful man, uh, a rich, wealthy man who had risen up the, the ranks uh, in the Jewish Sanhedrin. That was kind of like the governing body for the Jewish leaders. He had risen up and he comes to Jesus one night. Uh, in the dark, at night, so that he couldn't be seen. He started hearing about Jesus. He started to want to know more about who Jesus was, so he asked him questions. Now, he didn't want those other Jewish leaders to know he was doing this, or he could get in some trouble. So, he comes to Jesus and starts asking, uh, Jesus, I see that you're a teacher. I see that you do amazing, miraculous things, but I don't understand all that you are saying. Jesus told Nicodemus that to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Now we read in that passage where uh, Nicodemus is saying, well, I was already born. How can I be born again? He's asking Jesus these logical questions. And Jesus says, you must be born again. And he goes back to the Old Testament where he talks about Abraham and some others that we learn in uh, Hebrews 13 and some other things. 11 and some other passages that we can read, but we're not this morning, where we see that it's always been by faith. People believe in Jesus by faith. And Nicodemus, he's, he doesn't have all this figured out, but this is the background for where we come in John 3, 16. Now my question is, why does all this matter? And why does Christ make all the difference in the world for us who are Believers, Well, let's look at it this morning. Love first is found in Christ. Look at verse 16. All right, you can probably quote it with me. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We heard that verse. We know that verse. Quite possibly the most famous one in all of scripture. But what does it mean? What's he getting at in this verse as Jesus is telling Nicodemus? Let's break it down. Look at the words with me. Four. It's a transition. He's transitioning from verse 15 to verse 16 in our passage. And what he's connecting is that in order to be born again, you must believe. You must. For God so loved the world. There's something you must believe in order for this transition to take place in your life. This faith to be fulfilled in your life. He says, for God so loved the world. And we're going to come back to that word because world is important in this passage and it's often misunderstood in this passage. So I'm going to come back to it. But for God so loved the world. I will say this. Remember who Jesus is talking to. Nicodemus. He's not talking to you. He's not talking to me. In that original context, he's talking to this very powerful Jewish leader named Nicodemus who believed that only God loved the Jews only. That's what Nicodemus and most Jews at that time believed, that God's special love was only on the Jews. That's important as we read this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God sent Jesus to suffer and die to bear the penalty for our sins. 
what we could not accomplish on our own, what we could not believe or, or work towards, like in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, remember verse, we could not accomplish this task on our own. We can't save ourselves. And whoever believes in Him, and whoever embraces, trusts this message, this Jesus, should not perish, meaning eternal judgment in hell, but have eternal life. A life abundant with joy and immeasurable blessings in the presence of God forever. Now, let's go back to why the world is so important for us today. Because as I look out, I, I would imagine not many of us are Jewish in here. I, I'm just taking a guess. But most of us would be considered a Gentile, right? We're Gentiles. So why is this so important to us? Because the word world can be used a lot of different ways. Like sometimes I say, what in the world, right? Or Abby will say, oh man, what in the world, Dad? What are you saying to me now? Right? And it's always drama. But uh, I'll say the world is huge. We have a globe. It's huge. We could say you are living in this particular part of the world. Rarely in the New Testament is the word world used to refer to every single person throughout all time in any place. It's rarely ever used that way. So what should we understand this passage as? Let's go back to Nicodemus. Jewish leader, powerful, wealthy, very highly thought of, and this is who Jesus is talking to. So what do we make sense of this world? Well, what Jesus is trying to tell Nicodemus is that his salvation, the faith that is offered, the, the, the blessings that is offered, this gift that is offered to you is also offered to others as well. It's not only for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles alike. For God so loved the world. He loved every type of person. So what that means is it doesn't matter if you're tall, uh, short, uh, big, uh, small. It does not matter. American, Asian, African, European. It does not matter. We all come to the table the same way. We all enter before Jesus' presence the same way. Sinners in need of grace. That's how we come. Which is amazing. Because it means that... Salvation is available for sinners like you and I. It, it really does. It means that you or I can believe that when salvation is offered, eternal life with Jesus is offered to you and me. It does not matter your background, the baggage you carry. It does not matter what you bring to the table. Salvation is offered to you today. And for those who've experienced that, we know that there's a love there, right? We know that for God so loved me. This is where we can apply this personally. For God so loved Justin that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So if Justin believes, then I will not perish but have eternal life. And you can put your own name there and know that God loved you that much to give his son for you that you can spend an eternity with him. But that's not all. Keep reading with me. 17 through 18. Hope is found in Christ. It says, uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. We're building on verse 16. God did not send his Son. That's what it says. For God did not send his Son. Now this refers to Christ's first coming. At Christ's first coming, he came to bring salvation. He came to accomplish what he did on the cross, what we celebrate today as we, we think about him dying and being buried and rising again. This is why he came the first time. He did not come to condemn. He came to save. Yet we know at his second coming, he will come to bring judgment, execute uh, his righteousness uh, among the nations. 
But here's the hope for us today. For those who have believed, as we read this passage, for those who have believed, there is no condemnation for you. There is no judgment for you. You have been bought with a price. But for those who reject, it's a sad future uh, for you. It, it, you will be condemned. You will be judged. And this is why hope is so important. You see, a lot of us, and I was thinking about that this week, we, we look for something to hope in. And the problem is we often look in the, the temporary, this world, this this what culture has to offer. We may look to entertainment. We may look to this thing I like. We may look to that thing I like. But in the end, we find that, well, that thing's not so cool anymore. I need something else. That thing's not so great anymore. I need something else. And we keep looking for hope, and we keep being filled with this darkness. And the more and more that we look to the world for hope, the more and more dark things seem. And yet, right before our eyes, as we read this passage this morning, as we see here, we see hope written all over this passage because for those who believe, you will not be condemned. That is the hope of the gospel message. That is the hope that Jesus is offering you today. As Christians, we can rise up each day. We can walk out of here today. We can get up in the morning knowing that we have hope that the Son of God offers us Every single day, we serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who came, who conquered death, who did not stay in the grave, but rose again for us and is now in the same business. Who is, if you're a Christian, has saved you and is still saving sinners just like you and I. That is hope. But that's not it. Look at verses 19 through 21. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does not who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Sinful darkness. Is a very real thing. It, it, it really is. It, it doesn't take long to turn on any type of social media or news or anything. And you know darkness is a very real thing. There's a lot of wickedness out there. And throughout history, we find culture uh, pushing back against the light. And what I mean by the light, I mean Jesus is the light. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the light that we're talking about this morning. And yet, culture and the world, time and time again push against the light. They love the darkness. They want the darkness. They make it sound like they don't, but that's exactly what they want more and more of. And history just repeats itself over and over again. But for those who have seen the light, but for those who have seen Jesus, and what I mean is they open these scriptures and they hear the gospel and they believe that Jesus did die for them, that he was buried for them, that he did rise again for them. They have seen the light. They have seen through the darkness. They see the joy that is given for in this Christian life that we can experience with a relationship with Christ. Jesus brings the light of his salvation into a dark, dark world. Those who come to the light will never be the same thought of something this week as I was, we were, well, we had a lot of practices this week, baseball and softball, and you know, you get hit a few times, you get used to it after a while, but I was looking down, and I was checking my leg, because I thought I'd gotten hit a little hard, so I'm like, well, better check it, and so I'm looking at it, and I, I saw a scar that I have on my leg, and it, it runs up about halfway up my leg, and it got me thinking, because uh, as I'm thinking about this, and I'll say this, it's a good thing there were no phones or social media back when I was still in high school. 
all right? And for some of you, you know what I'm talking about because we did a lot of dumb things. And it is what it is, all right? And one night, uh, we were, my, my parents and friends' parents, they were all having a campfire, all this stuff, hook out. And so we're running through fields. We're doing all this stuff. We, we like to do stuff outside, you know. And so we're running outside, and I was probably in middle school at that time. And we're running out there, and uh, we're just, we had the moon, and it wasn't very bright that night. So we're running through this field that we've ridden through, I, I don't know how many times, a uh, thousand times, we'll just say that. So we're running through, and all of a sudden, I, I'm up in front, and I'm leading the way. And uh, as I'm looking, we see the light of their campfire, so we're kind of letting it guide us, but we don't know exactly where it is, but we know kind of how to get there. So we're running through, I'm going, we're going full blast. And we're running through this field, and all of a sudden, I hit something. And, I, and instead of just stopping, I raised up, and sure enough, the, the farmer who owned that property had put in a new barbed wire fence. And so when I run into it, and I raise up, it cuts up my entire leg. Right? I didn't know exactly what had happened yet, but I knew that did not feel good at this very moment. So I'm just sitting there. So we realize what's going on. I climb over the fence, and I, I'm starting to pull myself together. And my buddies are like, let's just keep going. I'm like, okay. Okay, I'm dragging my leg along, we're like, let's keep going. But it got me thinking this week, as I'm looking at that scar, and as I'm thinking about darkness and light. Because a lot of times in this life, it can seem like we're, we're going the right direction, right? We're, we're, we're pursuing God, we're pursuing all these things, but then something happens. It, it may be a sickness, it may be an illness, it may be uh, a car breaks down, it may be something else, a bad phone call, no matter what it is. It, 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 there's always something that comes up that kind of tries to deter us and pull us back towards the darkness, it seems like. Where we, we forget, where we're, we may forget to read our scriptures that day, we may forget to read our Bibles that day and, and, and pray that day. And we're, we're like, man, what is going on with my life right now? Why do I feel like I'm just... And experiencing this darkness in my life. And so many times we have to remember where's the joy found? It's right back in the lights. You see, Jesus didn't just save you. The gospel is not just there to save you. The gospel for the Christian is a hope that will bring joy every single day of your life. And that's why I emphasize so often to come back to the Word, be in the Word. Remember all that Christ has done for you. See, many, instead of looking to the light, they look for something. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's friends. Maybe it's country. Maybe it's uh, church attendance. Maybe it's morality. Maybe it's something they're doing in the community. They're looking for something that they can say, and that's where my joy is. But if I am not doing it for God, if I am not doing it for Christ, it will fade. Only the light of Christ will bring you the joy you've been searching for. Now, like Nicodemus, many have it up here, as I've said before, but they don't have it here. They never transition from, yeah, I know these verses. I've read these verses before. I've seen the signs. I've seen the scriptures. I've seen all these things. I know what Easter's all about. I could explain to you the whole story, but it's all up here. Until a radical transformation happens in your heart, it's only up here. That's why Paul made it clear uh, to the Philippian jailer that I, I read last week that you must repent and believe. You must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that Christ raised him from the dead. Now I ask you, have you repented and believed? Have you sought God's forgiveness? And I'm not talking about some magical prayer. I'm not talking about some magical wording, anything like that. But has that transformation, that, that moving from here to here happened in your life? Where you say, yes, I know that Jesus did those things, but I also believe by faith that God did those things for me. Have I believed? You must repent and believe in the gospel. And I encourage you and exhort you to do so today. But also for the Christian. That same hope, that same joy, that same gospel, again, it's for you. 
You see, so many times we get so caught up in the, the mundane, the life. I mean, I know all of you probably have a story about something that happened even this morning while you're getting ready. You know, one kid, she's going through her dresses, making sure she has the right earrings on, wants her hair done the right way. One kid says, I'm choking him with his tie, not that one. And uh, he can't breathe, and he's telling her, Dad, Dad, I can't breathe over here. I know these things happen. Some, there may have been even an argument on the way to church. Some, we, we have to get through. Some, you got up really early for the sunrise service, and uh, we're still kicking, right? We're, we're still going, but it's going to be a nap day, for sure. Uh, I understand those things. We all have things that happen in life. We all have, even in the Christian world. But how you handle those things, where you look for love, for hope, for joy, changes everything. And I would challenge you to continue to look to Christ for those things today. Let me close with a, a popular Easter song. I, I probably close with this every Easter, but... Here, here's what it says. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Oh, church, come stand in the light. The glory of God has defeated the night. Our God is not dead. He's alive. He's alive. Christ is risen from the dead. That's our hope. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. I am grateful for for these moments that we've opened up your the Gospel of John, your scriptures, and read about the love, hope, and joy that you give to us in Christ. And I pray that this Easter Sunday, if someone has not truly believed and repented of their sins, and come to you with faith, confessing you as Lord, their life. I just pray that they will do so today. That they will believe and give their lives to you. Embrace a life meant for a Christian. A life that full on embraces Jesus and lives for Him. And Lord, for the rest of us who are believers, I just pray that you will give us boldness and strength and courage to live out our faith so that others, when they see us, yes, there is something different and it, it promotes an opportunity to say, why are you different? Well, it's because Jesus has made a change. In my life. I just pray that you will give us the, the courage to persevere and be bold. Help us as we rely on you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.